wasn't supposed to preside today, but one of the brothers couldn't be here, and Tommy asked me. Any time that you can get the opportunity to speak and tell brothers and sisters in Christ what a great blessing it is to be a servant to the Almighty God, take it. Do the best you can. Every time I get the opportunity to speak, I may not do the best job, but I'm going to tell you one thing. I'll give it my best opportunity. Because Christ loved us so much that he went to the cross of Calvary that through his dying that we can have life eternal through him if we obey him and serve him to the best of our abilities. To me, this is the greatest thing it ever was when we come here each Lord's Day to partake of this bread and this fruit of the vine which represents Christ's body and the blood that he shed for the redemption of our sins. What a great blessing that is. And the more I study this will of God and ask for the knowledge and the wisdom that he may give me that I may tell you all and whomever I meet there's not a greater blessing in the world than serving God. To me this is Head. You just think about this. We were born and created in the image of God. And He gave us a mind and a, a will to make decisions in our life. Sometimes we don't do very good at that. But there's one thing about it. The decision you make when you were baptized into Christ was the greatest decision that you'll ever make in your life. I don't care what anybody says. Because we know if we obey Him and be faithful that at the end of our day here on earth we'll have life eternal with him. First Corinthians, the eleventh chapter. Don't take my word for this, but read it yourself. Now starting down about the twenty third verse. It says Christ took the bread and he broke it. He gave a prayer. He said, when you partake of this bread, you do show my death till I come again. And he is coming. In like manner, he took the cup, which is the fruit of the vine, <clears throat> which represents his shed blood that we can have the forgiveness of sin. And we do sin. But this blood continuously cleanses us as Christians. If you ever think about somebody that's never obeyed the gospel, It's not left to us to judge because he is the almighty judge and thanks be to God that he is 
because we do not have that right to judge somebody. But we should show our love towards him and teach him about his divine grace and love. <clears throat> Let's give thanks for the bread. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this bread which represents Christ's body that hang between heaven and earth for each one of us. As we partake of this, Lord, let's put our minds as clear as we can and let us think about how he suffered on that cross that day just because he loved us so. Thank you for this blessing that we have. And thank you that we live in a country such as this that we can come each Lord's Day and partake of this bread and this fruit of the vine. And that we're not bothered by the outside world that we can let our minds look to thee today we pray as we partake that we're so thankful and as we partake let us never forget what this stands for for it's in Christ's name I ask this amen Thanks for the fruit of the vine. Father in heaven, we thank you for this, the fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood that was shed for each and every one of us. We're so thankful for this blessing that we have today. Lord, it's a, 
unbelievable what you have done for us. We can't even imagine what it would be like without you giving your son that we may have life and have it more abundantly and that, that our lives will be better. So we just thank you for this blessing that we're about to partake of. Let us always have this opportunity if it be your will. Thank you for Jesus and his love for each and every one of us. For in Christ's name I ask this. Um, Romans twelve seventeen through 21. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. If he is doing in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Morning, Cross Point. It is good to all be back together again. Amen. Yeah, let's clap it. Like Jimmy said, we're still in the middle of this coronavirus thing, but we're doing our best to be safe. Amen. And so we're glad you're here this morning. We have missed seeing you all together. It's been um, trying to do two services when you're used to doing one gets kind of flustering at sometimes with technology and things, but we've had a lot of good people doing a lot of great work. And on top of that, all you guys praying for us. So thank you. And we love you all. So God is good. Amen. Um, before we get started, i got some uh, prayer requests and some good news. Um, A.J. Clark was baptized recently. That uh, belongs to Carmen and Don McDougal there. So God is good. 
Um, Charlie Purdue is a relation of my father-in-law. He, uh, it's my understanding he has the coronavirus and isn't doing very well, right? Um, and so please pray for Charlie Purdue um, as he is fighting to get through the coronavirus. Also, I got a text from Sarah Brown this morning asking us to pray for Bev Mackey, a um, former member here. She's going to have triple bypass surgery in the morning. Um, so pray for her. And also Rob asked that we pray for his dad, Phil. Uh, he's having a episode with Meniere's disease. It's kind of like vertigo. Um, so pray for him as well. Um, so before we get started, let us pray. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we love you so very much. We're grateful that we can all get back together again. I know there are still those of us that are missing, and that's okay too. We just are going to be here whenever people are comfortable um, coming back. Um, Father, um, thank you for seeing us through thus far, and we know that you'll see us through to the end no matter what, because you have overcome through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, we pray uh, praise you for AJ being baptized, that, uh, being added to your family. Uh, we pray for Charlie Purdue that you will take the coronavirus away from him and heal his body. Uh, we pray for Bev Mackey that you'll be with her as she has a triple bypass tomorrow um, and give her peace and give the doctors steady hands and uh, let her have a swift recovery. And we pray that you be with Phil Reichel and you'll relieve his Meniere's disease this morning. God, we pray you be with us all as we try and stay safe. Uh, we pray that you would take the coronavirus away from the world, Father, and bless those who are suffering with it. Um, Father, we pray you would heal our nation. There is so much anger, hatred, and, and silly things that are going on in our nation, God, that can only be solved by you changing people's hearts. And we pray that you do that. Father, um, please be with me in the words I speak. May they be from you and not from me. And may we um, hear your word and accept it and put it in our heart even if it hurts. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen. That's the best amen I've heard in six months. God is good. So over the past few weeks, we've been looking at how to kind of refocus as a congregation, kind of looking at some characteristics from Romans 12 um, as a template to refocus on what we do and how we do things and, and making sure we're keeping things really important in focus. And we've learned over the past four weeks that we're different by how we offer ourselves up to God, that we are a body, that we are love. And today we'll finish up this series with perhaps the most difficult thing we, we can become as good Christ followers. And that is the fact that we are forgivers. Let us just lay the text out in front of us again so we can kind of absorb it a little more that Jackson just read and meditate on it. Paul writes this in Romans chapter 12, starting verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible... As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. A lot of times when we read the epistles, Paul's letters, and, and all the other apostles' letters, we try and do a sort of reverse engineering on them where we filter Jesus through Paul, when really we should be filtering Paul through what Jesus has already said. Okay, Where would Paul get such a radical teaching that he brings forth in Romans 12? I mean, there, here's a man who has been whipped, stoned, beaten, betrayed, and shipwrecked. He's been through a lot of suffering at the hands of other people, yet he writes this incredible teaching on not paying back evil for evil, but forgiving other people when they do that. Where did he get it from? Well, he got it from Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 45, it says this. It says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. So what did Jesus teach us that our response must be when evil is aimed at us? He taught us that we are never more like God than when we forgive and return good for evil. We're never more like God than when we return good for evil and forgive other people. 
That's where Paul gets this incredibly difficult yet absolutely radical teaching from Jesus himself. As a congregation, as part of the church, we must model this out in our everyday lives for the world to see. But how? How am I supposed to love that person who wants to be my enemy? How am I supposed to repay good for evil? How am I supposed to live this out? This is hard. That's why this text is so important. Because a lot of, of a lot of the things that the church does, this is one we must get right, family. Let us break this text down. Paul says this in verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. So the desire to get even with anyone is an unchristlike attitude, period. The desire to get even with anyone is unchristlike, period. Instead, we are to make it our goal in life that we do not retaliate. Instead, we are to think this through beforehand. That way, when the moment comes, when you're faced with these kind of obstacles, when someone does evil to us, that we will be able to respond the way Jesus responded when he was faced with evil. We must be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone, believer and non-believer. And we should never go out of our way to offend anyone. Instead, Paul continues, if it is possible... As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Notice where the responsibility lands here. It's on you and me. Amen? It doesn't matter what he said or she did. If it is possible for my side, I am to seek and pursue peace with everyone. And yes, that means even those who don't think or act or believe like I do. Everyone. This verse also shows us that conflict is impossible to avoid. Others will force evil on us, brothers and sisters, but never let it be said that any blame is due to the one who calls themselves a Christian. We are called to be peacemakers, not pot stirrers. Let me say that again. We are called to be peacemakers, not pot stirrers. Keep reading. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Here's what this text means. You and I are not the judge. We are not the jury. We are not the executioner. We are not allowed to hold wrath. That is God's alone. You and I may make emotional snap judgment that we think are righteous, but we have no business making them. God is the one who will bring justice, amen? Not you and me. And that doesn't mean we passively sit by and watch injustice happen, but it does mean we don't get to charge anyone with anything. That is God's job, not yours or mine. God is the judge, the jury, amen? Instead of taking matters into your own hands, Paul, like, Paul tells us to do the opposite. He says, if your enemy is hungry, then feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, then give him something to drink. Why? Because it's not the way things are thought to work in this world. And by doing that, you will, keep, you will be like heaping burning coals on his head. And we sometimes smile at the thought that we are heaping burning coals on the head of our enemy, but that is the exact opposite of the principle taught here in this scripture. This passage is the practicality side of loving your enemy. When you do good, as, as it's described here, they often are taken aback and confused because they don't know how to respond because they're used to people trying to get even with them, trying to get back at them, trying to get revenge on them. But when you don't do that, it's so confusing. It's like that all of a sudden a burning pile of coals has been poured on them. You love them because love is the basis of your Christian character. It is why love generally heads the list for most Christians. The fruit of the, that the Spirit produces in Christians begins with love. Your genuine love for people who don't like you often frustrates them because they don't know how to respond to that type of kindness. That means you'll affect the person's conscience and that they will know what they did was wrong and it will lead them to hopefully change and maybe even lead them closer to God. 
whether they change or not, you will be in the right always for loving your enemies and serving them. And that's why it matters at the end of the day, because it's not about how they respond to you. It's about what you do to them, and you are to love your enemies. Amen? Our goal is often to get even with someone. But why in the world would you want to get even with someone you don't even like? Instead, you're not seeking to get even. You're seeking to get right. Paul finishes up this passage with this loaded sentence. In verse 21, he says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. Overcome evil with good. It's so easy to get mad, isn't it? It seems so natural to hold a grudge. It feels right. To get even. But brothers and sisters, that is not how we are to live. We are forgivers. Amen? Peter, the apostle, echoes what Paul is taught by Jesus when he writes this in 1 Peter 3.9. He says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing." Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. So Peter says do this because you'll be blessed by doing it because this is what you're supposed to be doing. But Peter, they deserve it. I know. But don't repay evil for evil. But Peter, they really hurt me. I know. Don't repay insult for insult. But that Facebook post, Peter, I know. Don't repay evil for evil. Instead, repay evil with a blessing or with good. When you're mistreated, offended, hurt, thrown away, abandoned, you just don't sit in neutral. You go positive and you be a blessing to the person or persons that did something to you. We see this modeled perfectly in the life of Jesus. He didn't just say, love your enemies or pray for those who persecute you or do not resist an evil person. It would be one thing if Jesus just said that and didn't do anything, but he did it. He lived it. In Luke 23, 33 through 34, we see this. It says, when they came to the place of the skull, they crucified him, Jesus, there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. This is huge. Not only did Jesus, the Creator, allow those who created him to kill him, he even forgave them while they were doing so. Mind blown, right? Think about that for a minute. That's exactly what you and I are asked to do. Peter and Paul are writing this to Christians who are being mistreated and persecuted for no other reason than their faith in Jesus. I mean, where did they get this stuff we saw? Where did Peter pick this up? This whole respond evil to good. Don't repay evil. Don't insult and strike back. Well, he got it from Jesus. And Peter was there again. We're going to read this again. With the day Jesus made a revolutionary statement that most of us have already heard today, but we need to hear it again. Matthew 5, 43 and 44. You have heard that it was said to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If you call yourself a Christian, if you follow Christ, then refusing to, to respond in this way, is, then, refusing, then refusing to respond like they did or repay evil with evil is the most Christ-like thing you can do. It is the most kingdom of God thing you will ever do on this planet. I want to close it out with three questions. Two of these are for everyone. One is specifically for those who would say that you're a Christian. The first one is this. Do I really want to be even with someone I don't even like? Do I really want to be even with someone I don't even like? No, you don't. To be even with someone you like is to be like the person you don't like. You do not want to be like that person. So the answer is no. Why would you act like that? I don't think you're going to want the end result of that because you will become the very thing you hate. Amen? 
The second question is this. What story do I want to tell? You should ask this question at every decision-making, choice-choosing part of your life because every choice you make becomes part of the story of you. Think about what's being said about you, how you're being mistreated, how angry you are. What story do you want to tell when this is nothing other than a story to tell? Do you really want your story to be, I got even, I became like the person I didn't even like? That's predictable. That's what the world expects. It's so unremarkable. Here's the final question specifically for Christians, but anyone can play along. But listen, if you're a Christian, we don't get the option to skip this stuff. We don't get a loophole. If we are Christ followers, this is Jesus 101. This is I have decided to follow Jesus. This is part of the deal. The question is, what would it look like for me to return good for evil? What would it look like for me to return good for evil? When you think about him, when you think about her, When you think about your ex, or your boss, or your son, or daughter, or your grown children, or you think about your parents, or you think about your your dad, or that neighbor, that co-worker, what would it look like in this specific context, in in that specific relationship, for you to return good for evil? To use Peter's words, what would it look like to be a blessing to someone who has hurt you? to someone who has offended you. Not just do nothing and ignore it and say silly things like, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. Not to just bury your head and pretend it didn't happen, but to be proactive in doing good to them. To do nothing is mercy. To not give what you deserve, that is called mercy. But to actually do something that they don't deserve, to give something they don't deserve, that is grace. And if you're a Christian, this is how your story intersects with the story of salvation. This is our best opportunity to be like our Father in Heaven. This is where our story intersects with the greatest story ever told. And the greatest story ever told is God returning good for evil. God giving His Son for our sins. That is the Gospel. And if you are a Christian, that is your story. Here's the thing then. Generosity and compassion. It's kind of a, an American thing, right? Everybody is generous. Everybody's compassionate. And that's good. That's a Christian thing. That's a leftover from a once Christian culture that's still on par for our culture. And I'm all for generosity and compassion. But it is expected. It's predictable. But this, this idea of returning good for evil, that takes you from predictable to remarkable. The thing that should set Christians apart is how we respond when evil is aimed at us. Look guys, we live in an absolutely terribly divided nation right now. We live in one of the most divisive times in American history. And our tendency is to blame the guy with the D next to his name or the guy with the R next to his name. Or the gal with the D next to her name, or the, the, the lady with the R next to her name, and we start putting our focus on these people are evil, they're the reason we have all these problems, and we get so wrapped up in it, we get so angry, and you know, I've seen Facebook posts, I know what people are posting on Facebook, I'm not blind to it, you know, and we see all these things, and we are guilty just as much as followers of Christ of returning evil for evil. We have to stop the bickering and the arguing about things that don't matter in the end. Jesus is king, amen? He's the only king you'll ever need. He's the only one you'll ever trust in for your salvation. And He's the only one that can get us out of this mess. Because He's the only one that can change somebody's heart. All this hate and anger and division in our country because people's hearts aren't right. We can't fix the problems until people fix their hearts. And the only way people's hearts get fixed is to get them to Jesus. 
And that's why showing the loving our enemies, repaying good with for evil is so important because you're going to show them something that is so otherworldly, so supernatural that they cannot help but want to be part of it. I mean, who loves people that hurt them? Who forgives someone who has hurt them? Who lets people off the hook when they deserve to be hung on a tree? And, and some of our vocabulary might say. Christians do. You let people off. You know why? Because you were let off. Jesus let you off the hook. Amen? When He died on the cross, your debt was paid. Every evil thing you did against God was forgiven when you were baptized. Every evil you had done was repaid with good because God loved you so much that while you were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And so we are to love our enemy. Not re over, be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Because here's the thing, good always wins. And it may seem like right now that is not true. It may seem like right now things are spiraling out of control, but let me tell you, God is on the throne and He knows exactly what He is doing. He is in charge. And good always wins. There's a, the verse in the opening lines of the Gospel of John that says, the light shined in the darkness and the darkness has never put it out. It will never put it out. The thing that should set Christians apart is that we should repay good for evil. And for someone in this room, that's going to be the thing that sets you free. Because if you don't return good for evil, the person who has mistreated you owns you. And here's how you know if they own you. Because you're rehearsing all the stuff that you're going to say and do. All the ways you're going to get them back. And when you find someone who will listen to your sad, sad story, they'll say, well, you ought to do this to them, or you ought to do that, and we'll put it on a I'm going to list. And the only thing that's going to free you is for you to proactively do for someone exactly what they don't deserve you to do for them. Just like your Father in Heaven. Do for someone exactly what they don't deserve you to do for them. Just like your Father in Heaven. Even is easy. Don't write a predict predictable story. Make yours remarkable. One day this will all be part of a story you tell. So what story do you want told when this is just a story that, it, that you tell? Some of you are probably thinking, that's easy for him to say. I have to get up. I, Scott just gets up there, talks, and then goes to lunch. He doesn't know my ex or my dad or my boss or my life. And I get that. I would never get up here and say all this on my own authority. How insensitive. How dare I? And that's why, Cross Point family, I hope you would anchor this in what your Father in Heaven has done for you because He is the one whose authority it comes from. Amen? This is the standard. This is the measurement. That's what, as Peter and Paul say, we are called to do. So what would it look like in your life, in your specific circumstances, in your church, at home, at work, for you to repay good for evil? Forgive, just as you have been forgiven. Now go and do likewise. Let's pray. Our Father in Heaven, this is really hard to love our enemies, to forgive those who hurt us, to let go of things that are wrong, to not want to strike back when we're struck. Father, with all the hate and division and things going on in our country, this is so hard for us to wrap our minds around. But Father, You've commanded us to be the light in the darkness. Let us speak reason. Let us not search after getting even. But let us do the right thing. Father, let us think before we speak. Be slow to anger. Let us fill our hearts with good things. With love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Father, transform our hearts so that we can help others get to you so they can change yours. So that you can change their hearts as well. I love you. We praise you. We thank you. Give us the strength to do these difficult things.
because we can only do them for you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. The church said, Amen. Right this morning, if you're not a Christian, we invite you uh, to become one by being baptized, by repenting of your sins and being baptized into Christ, receiving the Holy Spirit, and starting your life anew. Or if you need the prayers of the church, we'll be here. Whatever your need is, come forward right now while together we stand and sing.